Yeah. General Skinner, are you a gamer? No, sir, I'm not. not no Madden, no, like, my, EA my son Sports, is. Call of Duty. My son is, but I'm not. I'm not either. But uh, it seems as though a lot of our service members are. I mean, I've seen a lot of these USOs. They're building all these great gaming complexes. And I took interest in uh, a report that we were feeding some of the StarCraft II game models uh, into an integration with ChatGPT. And uh, this, this piece, uh, AI surpasses humans, US military chat GPT outperforms in war scenario planning. And I guess what they did in this case was they uh, told chat GPT to function as an assistant to a military commander in this engagement. So I, I imagine like an AI Dwight Schrute, assistant to the regional manager. But it turns out in changing conflict dynamics, the military assistant it turned out to be quite capable. So, Dr. Martell, you seem to have some uh, familiarity with this circumstance. What can we learn from uh, the integration of gaming models, AI, and military strategy? So I'll talk less about gaming because I'm not a gamer, um, but about uh, how we might effectively use tools, generative AI like ChatGPT. Um, my, we, we've been working really hard to figure out where and when uh, generative AI is going to be useful and where and when it's going to be dangerous. The, the danger is it's extremely difficult. It takes a very high cognitive load to validate the output of this model. And so there's a, a, a very large demand signal for um, AI to replace experts and allow novices to replace experts. That's where I think it's dangerous. Where I think it's going to be most effective is helping experts be better experts or helping someone who knows their job well be better at the job that they know well. I don't know, Dr. Martell, we're all on the front end of this wave, but I find a lot of novices uh, showing capability as experts when they're able to access these large language models. So if I, if I can, sir, there, I think the reason is it's extremely difficult to validate the output, right? So as long as there's a way, and I'm totally on board, as long as there's a way to easily check the output of the model, because hallucination hasn't gone away yet. There, there's lots of hope that hallucination will go away. Um, there's some research that says it won't ever go away. That's an empirical open question that I think we need to, to really continue to pay attention to. But most importantly, if it's a difficult to validate output, then it's gonna be, di then, then I'm very uncomfortable with it. Yeah, I mean, I've even used, just in my modest way, like Claude to audit the hallucinations of ChatGPT and vice versa. I can see the young people behind you nodding uh, in the affirmative. So sometimes that can be a check. And, and, and I, I think you're right on the outputs. I, I think you're, you're dead there, but I think it's dead right. I think it's interesting though, to think about this in terms of like an assistant. And then you, you, you think about that in the air domain, in the space domain. Um, I, I, but I want to get to the inputs as well, because sure. you made a really good point in your testimony about the quality of the data dictating kind of the ceiling right. on this enterprise. And I, I envision a circumstance where we're in this room marking up the NDAA, and there's a big fight among all the lobbyists for the defense contractors about who owns the data. Right, and, and there, just as we see in the large language models, the New York Times and these entities saying, well, you trained on our data and our stuff, and so we have some ownership interest in the work product that comes out. What, as, as you depart government service onto something else, what advice can you give the subcommittee about how to have as much of that data open source and acceptable so we don't have a circumstance where like Lockheed Martin is saying, well, we have to protect our source right. code on the, on the F-35. And, Back to that circumstance. Uh, so I think the, the right tactic there is to separate stovepipe solutions, which really are data all the way up to the end user, into two layers, a data layer and an app layer, an application layer, and then create two separate marketplaces. So the app marketplace makes perfect sense. You, you guys get it. it who, who's going to open my Word doc? Is it going to be Google or is it going to be Microsoft or some third party? That's the app layer. And, but then the actual word processing doc is, is the data layer. But you can also build a marketplace in the data layer. If Lockheed Martin had invested a great deal of IP in, in, and work to building out that data layer, well, maybe we pay them for access to that data 
uh, and figure out interesting contracting ways where they, where they can actually make money selling that data, not just to themselves, but to other app builders, but require that data be accessible. So I really think that's a really important point. We, we, you know, I hope we were able to get back to it at some point, because what I worry about is they'll create the cost of that data as so cost prohibitive, so as to vertically integrate all the features of the contract. And Mr. Sherman, who testified about contract sprawl earlier, I think is acknowledging that we're going to have to confront that. And, and I think it's yes, a sticky wicket. I think Thank that's you, right. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I co-led the